Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, normally we ask people to turn off their mobile phones and computers, but here, leave them on if you want. It's, uh, nothing could happen. Nothing bad is going to happen, we promise. Uh, my name is Matan Shaf. Very happy to welcome you here today. Uh, this is Guy Mizrahi. We'd like to say just a few words and then we're off. So, Guy? Hi, guys. Most of this cyber conference is about governments and other kind of uh, stuff. Uh, we wanted to make this uh, session about uh, hacking and technology. So we brought basically the best hackers in Israel to talk. So and in Bar. <laughs> um, so I, I guess that everyone that knows about cyber and technology uh, will be happy to be here. Thank you. Okay. So, wait, let me introduce you. Please do. So, the first speaker we have today. Cheers, by the way. Cheers. Every speaker has to drink. That's the rule of the house. So, so our first speaker is a very good friend, uh, Inbar Raz. Inbar is a very known figure in the cyber community and uh, a hacker specializing in social engineering, physical access, and drinking whiskey. Drinking whiskey. And he's now the CTO no, of, no, no? VP of research. VP of research. Uh, I just uh, made him CTO me, yeah. of uh, Perimeter X, which is an amazing startup, which I invite everyone to hear and ask Inbar about. It's so amazing that he's in the hacking, not in the startup. Yes. So, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this all is very informal, and as such, I'm now uh, setting a challenge for my fellow speakers. This is a challenge that has been running. I've been speaking all over the world in hacker conferences, and we've been doing this for a while. So what we're going to do, we're going to take our shoes off, and we're going to be speaking barefoot, which is kind of nice, especially in the summer. <laughs> and that's all informal. You're all invited to do the same, unless you've been wearing the same shoes and uh, socks for a while. So this is all in the name of informality. <laughs> if you uh, look at my Facebook photos, you will see photos of me speaking barefoot in Copenhagen just two weeks ago. So, oh, this is so nice. Anyway, I'm going to be talking about ethical hacking, okay? 15 minutes on ethical hacking, also known as white hat hacking. Who's uh, familiar with the term white hat hacking? Good, otherwise you shouldn't be here. So, where do we start? Who am I? I uh, started uh, computer science stuff when I was nine started reversing when I was 14. Basically, I wanted to crack games. That's how it all started. Uh, at 18, for some weird reason, I ended up in the tank war. I'm a certified tank commander. If you have a Merkava stock somewhere, give me a call. I'll help you uh, rescue that. And then I ended up uh, in uh, the military intelligence, spent there a large part of my career. Then I went to work at Checkpoint. Uh, I started the malware research and the vulnerability research group, spent there three years, and now I'm the VP of research at a new web and cloud security company called Perimeter X. In parallel to all that, I'm a volunteer member of, drum roll, the red team, which Karen was so kind to mention. This is a volunteer team. Uh, we do coordinated and collaborative red team attacks on uh, large uh, companies, corporations, whatever, that we feel that if they get compromised, the damage will be countrywide and not just local to the company. So, let's continue. Our world is basically vulnerable. We're surrounded by software that may, is being made by so many vendors. And on one hand, we have curious hackers. Kevin, this is for you. Um, People who just, you know, play around with stuff, they end up breaking things. On the other side, we have the professional hackers, the criminals, people that monetize on crime. Okay, the name of the game is now monetization. How can I make money out of stealing stuff? And then in the middle, we have all kinds of hacktivists. Okay, Syrian Electronic Army, Anonymous. And I left out the nation state because this is a game we don't want to play. The assumption is you can't really beat a nation state, so why bother? It's arguable, but it's out of the scope uh, of this discussion. So that means that someone needs to be doing the same thing and maybe get there first. Okay, what happens if we find the vulnerability first, we can get it fixed, and then there's one less door for the bad guys to walk through. So, 
That thing, turns out, has some problems in it. Just going and looking for vulnerabilities, even if you're a good person, it turns out that it's a little bit more complicated. There are three stages to the process of finding vulnerabilities. It's the finding of the vulnerability, it's the reporting of the vulnerability, and it's the publishing of the vulnerability. And each one of these stages has some points that we need to consider. For example, was it deliberate or accidental? Did I go looking for a vulnerability, or did I just accidentally try something and all of a sudden I reached somewhere I shouldn't have? It's not the same thing, OK? Um, did I use specific technique and hacking tools, or was I just playing around? If I'm using professional hacking tools, professional penetration testing tools, then it's not as if I was just playing around with some URLs or manually typing uh, what I hope would be SQL injection strings, OK? It's not the same thing. Um, data access and extraction. Do I access sensitive data? Do I extract it? Do I make copies of it? OK, it's not the same thing. What happens if I cause damage? Something happened. I'm pen testing somebody else's computer, and I did something. Deliberate, indeliberate. What are the consequences? That needs to be thought of. And what's the victim's point of view? I know that I'm a good guy. I know that I'm trying to make things better, but what does it look like on the other side? When they're looking at the same situation, what are they thinking? When it's time to report, it's a matter of timing. How quickly do I report? Do I take my time, or the minute I, get, I got something, I give them a call, or I write them the, the disclosure? Who do I report to? Is it some guy at the IT security? Is it the CISO? Okay. What language do I use? Is it an offensive language? Ha ha in your face, or hi, I found something I think you should uh, take a look at? Okay. Um, you have to be neutral. If I come to you and I say, so you have a problem, and I have just a product to help you, that may be perceived as extortion. And in fact, any lawyer will tell you that is the wrong thing to do. So you have to be neutral. Hi, you have a problem. It's your problem. You have to solve it. I'm not going to help you. I will give you, though, all the information that I have. And last, do you mention that you're going to publish that? Because that gets people into defense. Oh, you're going to publish that? No, no, we're going to sick our lawyers at you. Do you mention that? Do you not mention that? And then the last stage, the publishing. You want to publish what you did, because as a researcher, especially if you're an academic, you know that publications are your merit. If you don't publish anything, you don't exist. Your CV is empty. So what is the timing? Do I wait for the vulnerability to be patched? Do I wait for the patch to be deployed? OK, what sort of a patch is it? What forum do I publish it in? Is it this local blog post, post with my company? Do I go in a conference? Do I go on stage like here? Do I go to Brian Krebs and have it spilled all over the internet? What is the level of detail? Do I publish a proof of concept? A proof of concept is a loaded weapon. So unless the vulnerability has been patched, you don't want to issue a proof of concept, because that means that everyone can now use a loaded weapon to make the attack. And do you get credit? When I report a vulnerability, do I get credit? Because that, that's interesting. I, I'd like to be credited for my work. And then you have the vendor response. Do you include the vendor response when you publish? Do you wait for the vendor response to be published? And if you don't do that well, the result is this. In the US, they have this law. It's very bad. And then weird things start to happen. Because in the United States, they like making rules. They like being afraid of stuff. They're not always sure what they're afraid of, but rules is, is a good thing there. So a guy in the eighth grade is going to jail because he changed the background on his teacher's laptop with a password, by the way, that was given to him by the teacher or shown to him. We have a guy who used an open interface to extract email addresses of AT&T. He didn't break into anything. He didn't use any vulnerability other than ask a question and get a response. But he published it in the wrong way. So he got sentenced to 41 months in prison. And of course, the most famous example is Aaron Schwartz, who ended up committing suicide because he was facing a 10-year jail sentence, and maybe even more, just because he was doing a service to the community. At least that was uh, his intention. So the solution is actually ethical hacking. This is where we come in, the ethical hacker. And there's a lot to read here. You can either listen to me or read that. But basically, an ethical hacker is a guy that looks for vulnerabilities in order to report them and get them fixed. We 
like to uh, make the world a better place. And I know that a lot of companies say that, and in some way they might actually do that, but this is the pure semi-altruism, because we all know there's no such thing as altruism. I want to get it fixed. I also want to get the credit for it, but this is why we do it. There is a problem, and I like to use the example of my dad. Okay? If there's a vulnerability somewhere that if it's not fixed, then some hacker is going to use it, and then my dad is going to get damaged in any way, then that's where I want to be. I want to fix that because no one else is protecting my dad, or your dad for that matter. Now, some people will say, well, what about bug bounty programs? Who knows what bug bounty programs are? OK, that's roughly half the people. Bug bounty program is when a vendor says, everyone, please find bugs. Please report to me, and I will pay you, pay you money for that. That's a good incentive. Okay? But even with bug bounty programs, uh, the most famous one, by the way, was Microsoft's bug bounty program. It was uh, founded by Katie Masuris. And then we have the Facebook uh, nice logo bug bounty program. Even bug bounty programs leave out some things. For example, they'd like to be reported about a vulnerability, but do they tell you how to do that? Or can you just do whatever you want as long as you report it? Because hacking can also cause damage, as I mentioned before. So this guy, he's a Dutch professor in the University of Amsterdam. He's called Jeroen van der Ham. And he's teaching ethical hacking in the university. Now this guy uh, gave a talk called Hacking Ethics in Education last year in the CCC conference in Hamburg. And he explains how they are teaching ethics into the hacking. They're giving a hacking course. And then there's an ethics committee for every project framework that the students write. And he declared a traffic light protocol. And what I'm going to show you now is actually quotes from him. The terminology here is straight out of the presentation. Green is no ethical consideration involved. For example, if we're working on an open source software, right? We're not touching anyone. What happens if we're working on, a, on an offline database? There's no harm done. We can do whatever we want. Yellow is if we make it into contact with personal data in a very confined way. For example, if I do some research and I get somebody's uh, address, but that, just their address. It's not their uh, social security number. It's not their ID number. It's not their credit card number. So it's personal information, but it's not that big of a deal. And if we create any damage, it's going to be insignificant. The next stage, the orange stage, is when you might actually stumble upon or get access to large quantities of data. For example, if I facilitate a hack into the database of a credit card company, or Target for that matter, I get credit cards of a lot of people. That has a lot of significance. If I get their social security number, the OPM hack that happened in the, new, in the US just recently, all the personal information of all the federal uh, government's employees was stolen. That's a lot of personal information. Or if there is the process, if I hurt it, if I cause damage while doing that, that might be a serious thing. And the last thing is red. Red means projects that cross the line but are still important to do anyway. Okay? For example, the OPM. If, the, if someone did or if someone had done ethical hacking on the OPM and discovered that they're vulnerable, that is so huge that doing that is actually worth the chance of getting into trouble because it's such a big problem. In April, uh, thanks to Kevin, was it, right? Once again, mentioning your name, I got invited to participate in a panel in a conference called GCCS, Global Conference on Cybersecurity, in The Hague. That was organized by the Dutch government. The participants were actually representatives of governments. We had uh, foreign affairs ministers, we had ambassadors, we had chief information security officers for governments. And the conference lasted two days, covered a lot of ground. But I participated on a panel, or in a panel, about ethical hacking. Now, just in case you don't know who's sitting here, this is Katie Masuris, which I mentioned before. She started the Bag Bounty program in Microsoft. This guy works, I think, at the, uh, who does Zero Day Initiative? Is it HP? HP. Um, this guy here is the national prosecutor in the Netherlands for uh, cybercrime. That is me. This guy, the Dark Tangent, he is the founder of Black Hat and DEF CON, the famous hacker conferences. And here there are two uh, Dutch professors, and this lady works in the Hungarian government. 
So this is all online. You can look it up. We talked for 90 minutes on ethical hacking, how to do it right, what are the problems that we're facing. And at the end of the conference, we decided to have a follow-up meeting. We went into a room and we created a work group with the purpose of formalizing the process of coordinating disclosures. So we called it the Organization for Coordinated Disclosure, which of course has the excellent initials of OCD. <laughs> and the purpose of this is to make a process that lets you do it in the right way without hurting anyone and without being hurt. So the resolutions that we had here, we, there, sorry, we had a bunch of those. I'm just going to give three because they're the most important. The first one, create a safe environment and protections for vulnerability finders. We are very vulnerable ourselves. If I report to someone and they don't like it, they can sue me. And I just came to them with, with, a, with, with a problem that they have, right? I am still at risk. We want to emphasize the, the maintenance of privacy protection for user and personally identifiable information. It's nice that you want to find a vulnerability, but you cannot create a new risk that did not exist before. Stealing the entire database just to prove that there's a vulnerability, that's not the right thing to do. If you can hack into the database and steal just two passwords, it's good enough. It proves the point. And last, reaffirm the principle of doing mutually no harm for security researching and responding to a finder. So once again, I will cause you no harm when I look for the vulnerabilities. You will cause me no harm when I report it because I'm doing it in our both interest. And of course, no good deed goes unpunished. We uh, at Perimeter X actually performed such a research last week and we did it by the book. We created a project framework, an ethical hacking project framework. We identified the sensitive information. We declared what must not be done. We declared how to take the data from the server, do the processing, immediately dispose of it in such a way that cannot be traced back. We did all that and somehow we apparently crashed some server. So once that happened, we immediately sent out the disclosure. Okay? And it turned out three days later that the company that was giving the service was actually using a third party. So what we crashed was not the website to which we reported, but actually a third party vendor. So we contacted them as well. And we sent them an updated version of the disclosure. And then I give the guy a call and I'm all ecstatic. I'm like, dude, I sent you the report. Did you get it? And he's like, we're on our way to the police. You stole our information. You crashed our website. And I'm like, what? What? Of course, first you hang up, then you call your lawyer. Right? We're a company, we have a lawyer. But to make a long story short, it was a misunderstanding. And if you remember, I mentioned before the, what it looks like, what is the point of view of the other guy? He really felt we were stealing information. He really felt we were out to cause him damage. But once we explained ourselves, then it all went away. So even when you do it by the book, you never know who you're dealing with. Maybe they don't like the attention. Maybe they really think you're lying. Things can, only, can always go wrong. So be prepared. Have an attorney. Thank you. Mm-hmm.